Hello, hello, hello. You are listening to and watching the STD Project's STD Podcast. My name is Janelle Marie Pierce. I'm the executive director of the stdproject.com, the spokesperson for positivesingles.com, and the founder of the Herpes Activist Network, which is called HANDS, and that stands for Herpes Activist Networking to Dismantle Stigma. Welcome to today's podcast. This podcast is being brought to you by Anti-Aging Systems at www.antiaging-systems.com. They're a distributor of BHT. For those of you who don't know what BHT is, BHT is a potent antioxidant, and it's a common food preservative that's also known to treat viruses, including herpes. Again, you can find them at www.antiaging-systems.com. So today's podcast is all about the difference between HSV-1 and HSV-2, or oral herpes versus genital herpes. So the very cut and dry answer to, is there a difference between HSV-1 and HSV-2, oral herpes versus genital herpes, Oral herpes is sometimes called cold sores too, so cold sores versus genital herpes. And the answer is no, there is no difference. Herpes is herpes is herpes. Before everybody gets all up in arms and their undies in a bundle, technically there are some differences between the two types, but we're gonna work through that and break it down. So let's work backward in terms of this information, why there is some difference or difference in perception when it comes to talking about oral herpes versus genital herpes or HSV-1, which is herpes simplex virus type 1 versus herpes simplex virus type 2. So HSV-1 and HSV-2 are all part of the human herpes viruses. They're in the family of nine different viruses. In the family of human herpes viruses, that also includes things like shingles, mono, the chicken pox. Those are all herpes viruses. The herpes simplex viruses are two specific types. We didn't know, though, that there were even two specific types until the late 60s. Before that, herpes was just diagnosed as herpes. Your doctor diagnosed you by looking at it and said, yep, that's herpes. Reason why is because it all looks very similar. That said, once we were able to type specify the specific viruses, then we were able to look into what the risk was in terms of transmission, how often one type was in one location versus the other. So since then, since the 60s, it's been commonly thought of that oral herpes is HSV-1 and genital herpes is HSV-2. However, now we know that both types can be in both locations. Even so, HSV-1 is more commonly oral and HSV-2 is more commonly genital, but that's quickly changing and that's because of oral sex. So there's risk involved in every activity and everything we do, but we have not been taught and it's not widely communicated that a cold sore, something that people have on their mouths or on their faces from a young early age can be transmitted to the genitals. So we're seeing a huge increase in genital HSV-1 infections. And then we still see HSV-2 orally as well. And that's for the same reason, oral sex. Hey, high five for oral sex, right? We're gonna take a break from this message for our sponsor. Our sponsor today is Anti-Aging Systems. Anti-Aging Systems distributes BHT. BHT is a potent antioxidant. It's a common food preservative and it's also known to treat viruses, including herpes. It's believed to work against the virus by potentially damaging the protective layer of the viral cell. In turn, it makes the virus vulnerable to the immune system, which may result in preventing the virus from multiplying and causing outbreaks, whether it's HIV HSV-1 or HSV-2. How great is that? If you want to give BHT a try, go to www.antiaging-systems.com. Use STD as your coupon code to get 10% off. So back to HSV-1 versus HSV-2 or oral versus genital. So we know now that HSV-1 and HSV-2 can be both orally and genitally, although a lot of times people perceive one as the good herpes and one as the bad herpes, and that's again because of stigma. It's social perception, it's a misconception, and somewhat of a misnomer because now we're seeing, especially if we look at like the UK, the UK has more infections of HSV-1 genitally now than they do of HSV-2. And again, it's because of the lack of information surrounding risk, 
and protection and ways to reduce risk when it comes to oral sex. A lot of people feel like they're being safer when they're engaging and enjoying, hopefully enjoying, oral sex. However, there's still risk involved. There's risk in everything we do, right? As soon as we step out the door of our houses, even if we stayed in our houses all day long, there's some risk involved in that. So there's risk in everything we do, and we just hope that there's an equal and opposite reward. But we're still going to engage in that risk because we want that reward. And then sometimes things happen that are not necessarily ideal, but they're a part of our human experience. And that is exactly what HSV-1 and HSV-2 are, a part of our human experience. Again, nobody wants a new infection. I don't want a cold or the flu, anything new, any kind of malady or ailment or something that potentially might compromise my immune system or just be uncomfortable or not fun. And actually, if you get active outbreaks like I do, I've had herpes HSV-2 genitally since I was 16. I do get active outbreaks and they're not ideal. They're not enjoyable or delightful, but they're also not awful. They're not the end of the world and I don't get them very often. They're manageable. At the beginning of the podcast, though, I mentioned that even though they are kind of the same, or at least like in terms of how they manifest, oftentimes very similar in how they're treated, they can be both locations, there are some differences. The differences are that DNA-wise, they share DNA, but then they also have a lot of different DNA. And that comes into play when we're talking about risk. When you have herpes, you can, even if you don't have active outbreaks, so if you never notice any signs or symptoms, you are still a carrier, you're still someone who has the infection. A lot of times that gets communicated that you are, you have been exposed to the virus. And I think that that can be misleading. And I think that we have to be very careful as educators and when we're talking about herpes in general, to not make it sound like there is not a risk involved if you don't have active outbreaks. And the reason I'm saying that is because if you test positive for HSV-1 or 2 on a blood test, they won't tell you where it's located because there's no way to determine that, which is also one of the many reasons why blood tests are actually recommended right now by most clinicians or the CDC. However, if you do get a blood test and it comes back as you're positive for HSV-1 or 2, it could be in either location, and then you may never actually get an active outbreak. So a lot of folks will say, well, that means you've been exposed to the virus. But if you test positive, yes, you've been exposed to the virus, but that means you're also carrying it, and that means you still can have shedding, viral shedding. And viral shedding happens a small percentage of the time every month, and there's no way to tell when you're virally shedding. That said, even if you have herpes, whichever strain you have, you're still virally shedding a very small percentage of the time. So let's put it into actual practical numbers. If you have HSV2 genitally, at max you will shed around 10% per month. So out of 30 days in the month, that means about three days per month. So you may not have a blister, any sort of uncomfortable sign, symptom, you might not have a clue that you actually have the infection, but three days out of the month, you're shedding the virus and then you can transmit it to other folks. Same happens with HSV-1. You have HSV-1 orally, which is more of the traditional location for HSV-1 to be. You are shedding around that percentage, that same 10% at max. Now, everyone's bodies and immune systems are different. That's the only caveat is we don't know how your immune system is going to interact, how the antibodies are going to come into play. So what your actual percentage is, it may be a little bit lower than that. It may be the same amount. It may be the maximum. Who knows? So the maximum is right about 10% per month if you have HSV-1 orally or HSV-2 genitally. However, if you have them in opposite locations, so you have HSV-1 in a genital location, you are virally shedding about half as often. Same applies for if you have HSV-2 orally, you're virally shedding about half as often, so one or maybe one and a half days per month. But when it comes down to whether herpes is good or bad, that's all about perception and society and stigma. It all plays into a moral idea of how it was contracted for one and what you might have done to obtain it. and. Not only that, but there is a it's, a, it's a form of social control, ultimately. It's a way of shaming people about something that is almost inevitable. Like again, nobody wants herpes, nobody wants an infection, any kind, nobody wants a cold or the flu, but some of these things just happen because they're part of our human experience. They're part of the risk that's involved in being sexually intimate 
with someone else's body. So that's all to say that yes, there actually are differences between the two infections. There's DNA differences, there's a little bit difference in risk and transmittability. All of that actually does have some relevance, but when you're just talking about herpes, each strain can be in each location. When they actually come out as an outbreak, they manifest very similarly. And overall, folks didn't actually care whether it was type one or type two until we figured out that we could actually specify type specific in a test. Then we started designating that one must be better than the other. And we started putting our moral barometer and applying it to these infections. And these infections just simply don't care. It's all about which area of the body they were exposed to, whether or not there was viral shedding happening, and then what your immune system is doing as a result. So there are so many people who have HSV-1 or HSV-2 and have no idea because they never get signs or symptoms. They don't have active outbreaks like I do, and they just don't know because testing isn't a regular thing. In short, whether you have HSV-1 or HSV-2, oral or genital, there's nothing wrong with you, dirty, bad, or otherwise. There is no good, bad depiction that's just an idea that has been imposed upon folks in order to make you feel bad about something that is almost irrelevant and not a big issue in the long run and in the scheme of things. Now I know you're saying like, okay, that's so much easier said than done because you have herpes and of course you want everyone to think that, but it's about education, it's about awareness. The majority of people have herpes. And I think the big takeaway is that there's always risk involved when you're engaging in partnered activities. You're sharing your body intimately with someone else and so there's going to be some risk. Misconceptions and stigma will have you believe that contracting one type of herpes, whether you contracted that when you were little versus contracting it when you're an adult, is somehow better than the other, but ultimately there really is not a big difference between the two. They're basically the same thing. They are all herpes. And earlier, before the 60s, we just called it that. At the end of the day, it's up to you to decide how you want to feel about it with additional knowledge, additional resources, backing and support, and knowing and understanding risk and transmission and rates and stuff like that. It's all good and helpful information, and then you can go forward and feel empowered and excited about your decisions. If you like this podcast, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, renew your podcast subscription so that you get updates every time we post a new podcast. Leave us a comment. Let us know if we've helped what you think about what we have to say, check out the stdproject.com. Listen in next time as we talk about all things STIs, STDs, living with STIs and STDs, and working on dispelling and eradicating stigma. Until then.